Good morning, church. How are we? Everybody doing okay? Y'all go and have a seat. Let's get rolling this morning. We'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So go and grab your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be starting off in verse 11 together this morning. So as you work your way there, we're continuing our... What we see in our lives as Christians is that our life is a series of trade-ins. A series of choices that we make. Who we're going to follow, what we're going to do. Jesus calls us to follow him and to trade in those things that we used to treasure. Our treasure changes as we follow Jesus. At least it should if you're following Jesus. Ephesians 4 tells us like this. It says, take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, and put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness. And this is done by faith in Christ Jesus alone. And this is an unfair trade. Here's what I mean. John 3, 16. We know it so well, but I think we get numb to it. Jesus tells us, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave. He gave his one and only son. Uh, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So he gives, and what do we trade in for? To receive by believing, also known as doing nothing. We do nothing. This is an unfair trade. And so everything that we do, decisions we make, come from knowing this truth on how amazing God's love is and how giving he is. So we trade in. Following Jesus is a series of trade-ins for trade-ups. And what I want us to see throughout this time together is Jesus is better. You name the thing, I'm trying to get ahead of myself already, but Jesus is better. Which brings us to verse 11. 1 Timothy 6, 11 says this. But you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And so this is a great time to talk about studying the Bible. And so you got to know what these things are. Because what we do is we section scriptures out. And by, the, by and large, as a church, our main diet of scripture comes verse by verse through the Bible. And so it's helpful to back up for a minute to verse 10, which we covered last week. Because these things does definitely connect there, but also connects to the letter itself. But the warning to flee these things immediately follows the warning against the temptation to love money. Yeah, I'm not going to redo last week's sermon. But verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. And this craving it also means like stretching for it. With all you have, stretching towards this thing. It reminds me of my now three-year-old. This guy, if you've seen him running around here, he doesn't really miss a meal. He's built like a tank. He loves sweets. And so, uh, yeah, who doesn't, right? He loves sweets. And so er, since he's been a walker, he craves the things that are on the counter, right? Just beyond arm's length. So we have sweets or donuts, whatever it is. You can see him like in the kitchen just stretching with all he has. And he can't quite get it. But he's stretching and stretches and stretches. But he's also growing, And mom and dad forgets that he's getting taller. And one day, my little guy was being unusually quiet. Our household is not a quiet house. We got some action and energy always flowing through our household. And when someone is quiet, you know something is wrong. And so my little guy was quiet. And so we walk in there, and apparently his stretching combined with his growing, and he got a dozen donuts that was hanging on the counter. And he was just feeding himself, going to town, in his happy place. Got what he was craving after. And what's amazing, so Siri got what he's craving. And do you know, this is months ago, do you know he still craves donuts? That didn't satisfy. Isn't that amazing? He got what he wanted. He's been searching for all his life, right? And got it. And he still has his craving for sweets. 
Interesting. It says, by craving it, many have wandered away. Meaning misled is what wandered means. Been misled. Believing that it, especially a love of money here, but you name the it in your life. Is it the love of money? What is it that you're craving and stretching after that's been misleading you? Believing that it is better. And this is where a source of sin is. Believing God is holding the better back from you. This is Genesis 3. Don't touch the one tree. Don't eat from it, right? Adam says, don't touch and eat from it. But then they see it's good. And they believe the lie that God's holding back from them. And it's pleasing. And they lust after it. And they cave into temptation because they believed that God was holding better back. And we all have this weakness to wander. The old hymn goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We all have this weakness to wander after what is ultimately worthless. I say worthless because worth is based on what is compared to. So, for example, Dunkin' Donuts is good. It's good. It's good until you've had Krispy Kreme. Okay? Then, it's not so good anymore. Like, I, Dunkin' Donuts does not satisfy me because I've had Krispy Kreme now. So, in comparison, to me, Dunkin' Donuts is about worthless. I know that's extreme, but if you haven't had Krispy Kreme, check them out. It's pretty good. We're not being sponsored by Krispy Kreme. But Krispy Kreme is better. And so Duncan doesn't satisfy. That's what we've got to get to. This is what I was thinking about this. Last week, this week, and next week should be its own separate series. Because what we're seeing is Jesus is better and nothing else will ever satisfy your cravings outside of knowing Jesus. Nothing. You'll always be craving something, always trying to fill that hole that you're created to have that only Jesus can fill. And so we crave when Jesus had this encounter in Matthew 22 with this lawyer. And this lawyer came to Jesus trying to trip him up in his words. Trying to trick him, trying to get him to misteach, misspeak. And this lawyer says, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? To which Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And like a good preacher, he added some more words. Also, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, write that down, that would be a church, good church mission statement. No, he didn't say that. Here's the point. We are called, commanded to love the Lord. So why is the love of the Lord the greatest command and the number one priority in your life? And by you, I mean Christian and non-Christian. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. I can go step in front of a train and believe it's not going to kill me all day long. Let's just be blunt. Like we feel like if we don't believe something, it means it's not true. It's still true. It still remains true. God is unchanging and he is the only source of all truth. So you, me, everyone who's ever breathed a breath in this life has been commanded to love the Lord. Why? Because he is worthy because of his worth. And secondly, because you and I need him. We need him. So we trade in our love for self and trade up for love for God because only he satisfies. And flowing from the love for the Lord and trusting his word, we flee from these things that desire our devotion. These things... These things that we are prone to wonder after and stretch for. What are these things in your life? Maybe here's a few. Maybe success. Are we stretching for, craving success? Security and safety, self-sufficiency. How about satisfaction? Let me ask a couple questions real quick. So success. Think about this. How will you have time to invest in God's kingdom when you're too busy building your own? 
How about security and safety? How will those in dangerous places who are far from God ever hear the gospel and come to Christ? Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the message about about Christ. But we're so concerned about security and safety, we coldly neglect those who are far off because it is unsafe. But we sure hope someone else does it. How about self-sufficiency? How can you grow in your faith when you're too busy having faith in yourself? How about satisfaction? How will you ever know the satisfaction that comes in Christ when you've been too busy chasing contentment in people, places, and possessions? The Rolling Stones say it rightly. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. Not churchy enough. So for you churchy folks, how about King Solomon? The wisest person who's ever lived, and by the way, very, very wealthy. Says, compared to God, everything is futile. Everything's a waste. Everything is worthless. Because he knows the Lord. And this is a man that saw and had everything. I think there's some wisdom to be gleaned from that. So we flee those things that fight for our faith. So what are those things in your life that you need to flee starting today? What do you need to flee? When faced with temptation, do you flee it or do you feed it? This is what we all have to come down to. Are you fleeing temptation or are you feeding it and caving into it because we're craving after it? 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that God's faithful and he'll provide a way of escape when faced with temptation. Fleeing and pursuing is leaving and seeking, turning from to turning to, trading in to trading up. Colossians 3.1 tells us, so if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above. So if you've been raised with Christ, if you put your faith in Jesus, that is our focus. That's our attention. That's where our heart and our gaze and our eyes are fixed. So we pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Pursuing Jesus is to pursue these things because only Jesus gives these things. So my question is, are these things regular rhythms of your life? Sure, all the, some of us can nail gentleness every once in a while. Some of us can nail being loving every once in a while. But are you known for these things? Because these are the things that Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, produces in us because we've been made new by faith in Jesus alone, by his grace alone, in Christ alone. So more simply put, Paul calls here, in verse 11, flee and pursue, what James, in James 4, 7, calls submit and resist. James 4, 7 says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm a simple person. I love simple things. This is a two-step simple process that we get jacked up all the time. Because what we do, we see, see a scheme, we see a temptation, we see a struggle, and we try to grind through it. We try to work harder. We try to suck it up and push through it. And what this says, it says, first, submit to God. And then resist the devil. And I love the word Resist. It means war against, to be hostile against, to fight against. Do you fight with hostility towards the temptation to sin? Or do you dance around it a little bit? Be honest. We wonder why we get our teeth kicked in so much. It's because we've not submitted and been hostile against those things that we're tempted to stray into. Ephesians 6.11 tells us to put on the full armor of God, also known as pursue and submit, so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil, that is, flee and resist. And so it says, submit to God, resist the devil, and look who's fleeing now. The devil. He will flee from you. Submit and pursue Jesus while fleeing and fighting the adversary, which leads us in verse 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And Paul again is making an athletic reference, comparison, competing or contending for a prize. 
In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and 25, Paul writes this. He says, don't you know that the runners in the stadium all run a race, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we, an imperishable crown. And two things I just want to take away from. One, genuine faith is active, not passive. We have an active faith. We're called to be actively pursuing Jesus, not passively pursuing Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 7 that every good tree produces good fruit. Also known as genuine Christians show Christ. Genuine Christians show Christ. Now are you going to stumble? Of course, we're not perfect. Yet, are stumbling the regular rhythm of your life? Are you regularly pursuing the fruit, the spirit of Jesus in your life? Can people identify you as saying you have been in the presence of Jesus because of the way you act and what you show and how you treat people and how you speak? And here's the truth. Jesus says in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that says they're a Christian is a Christian. And this is my fear for our church and every church, USA, every church around the world, is that we feel like we're a Christian because we do certain things. And it's not true. It comes by faith alone, in Christ alone, in Jesus alone. And not because you know how to do it or because you know the facts, but you believe that the heart and the head are connected. So we see that genuine faith is active, not passive. And number two, life of pursuing Jesus is like that of an athletic competition. It takes discipline. And I think we miss this. We feel like just, I'll just, it'll just happen. I'll be more like Christ just by osmosis. And, you know, it just, just happens over time. And it takes discipline. It takes work. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he puts the work in us. But it takes work on our behalf. Namely, the number one discipline, reading God's word. Number one, I'm not saying, this study came out, I quoted it several months ago. I'm going to quote it again. I'll probably quote it many other times because it's so powerful. The Center of Bible Engagement did a study over over 40,000 people ranging from age 8 to 80 of Bible engagement. That means more just like flipping a book open and hitting a verse and like, okay, that's what God has for me today. This is Bible engagement. This is quality time. They said those who had Bible engagement one time a week, they seen little to no change in their life. Life change. Those who had Bible engagement two times a week had little to no life change. Three times a week they saw maybe a little glimpse of life change, but not much. Those who had Bible engagement four times a week, they saw significant life change. Four times a week. This is what they showed. Four times a week, significant life change. The feeling of loneliness dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Sex outside of marriage dropped 68%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. And discipling others jumped 230%. Number one discipline. So if you are feeling lonely, having anger issues, or bitterness, struggling with any addiction, including alcoholism, feeling spiritually stagnant, getting your teeth kicked in by you name the sin, whether it's sexual immorality, pornography, you're not sharing your faith, you're not in discipleships, guess what? Go to the God's word. Go to God's word. Go to God's word and listen. I know we touched on loneliness. I know there's other things that drive loneliness. Start with God's word. I'm not against people and pills. I'm not. God's graciousness and common grace in different ways because depression, I get it. But don't neglect God's word. Go there first. This is the number one discipline. Here's what the Bible says about the Bible. Ready? The Bible says about the Bible is the word of God is living and effective. Hebrews 4. 
So if it is, why don't we treat it like it is? Because we see the very visible effects of God's word. It is living and effective. And so why do we not trade in our time for things that matter like this? And so here's what gets busy. Your schedules get busy. They get full. The number one thing that goes is time with the Lord. Let's be honest. Like, look at your own schedules. Look at what you fill your schedules with, me too, and the things that get carved out first is time with the Lord. And then time gathered as a church. And these are things that we're not to neglect because that's the way God wired us, to be spending time with him and with his people. And unlike athletes who work hard for a temporary crown and reward, we Race, we fight while fixing our eyes on the eternal prize, that is Jesus, who changes everything. And so what we see here is Paul reminds Timothy of his confession in front of many witnesses. Let me ask you, do you have a good confession of faith? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us to test yourself and see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. And so let me ask you, as we're talking about Jesus is better and Jesus is the only one that satisfies, let me ask you, do you have Jesus? Do you have Jesus? This is the number one thing that changes everything, is do you have Jesus? Not do you know about Jesus. Not can you quote the Bible. Not have you been to church. Man, you've made it to church three out of four Sundays this month. Praise the Lord, right? Do you have Jesus? Do you trust him as Lord? Romans 10, 9 says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart and God raised, from, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's more than just saying it, it's believing it. It's a both and. So is your confession that Jesus is Lord over your life. This is we trust Jesus as Savior over ourselves and we trust in his ways over our ways. And pursuing Jesus in a life of obedience. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Why? Well, Isaiah 55 answers it, verse 8. For my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. Guess what? God knows more about you than you do. And he knows more about your life than you do. Do we trust him? It's amazing to me that statistically speaking, kids come to faith at a higher percentage than adults. It's funny to me. Number one, two things. Number one, it shows the significance and importance of kids' ministry. We at this church, we prioritize kids' ministry. And just be honest, we need more help in kids' ministry. We're getting by, but kids' ministry matters so much. So I pray that this church values and invests in kids' ministry. So number one, kids' ministry matters. Number two, parents, your ministry matters. Are you discipling your kids? Number three, adults are dumb. I'm all right for that, were you? Y'all are pretty good. But overall, adults are dumb. Like, we come get hardened, we get callous, we get old and grumpy and crotchety. Adults, we're crazy. Just think about it. How many times do you have to fail and fall and fumble throughout life before you finally realize, man, I'm a pretty crummy God. I am not a good Lord of my life. I'm not doing this thing well. We all have our moments, and I think that's where we fall. Like, we have this good moment. We're like, man, I'm doing pretty good. And then we remember that, not the 40 times we failed and fumbled trying to get there. What if you're falling, fumbling, and failing, and stresses and concerns and anxieties and fears is all to get you to the point to make you realize that you're not God, and you need him? It's amazing to me. I really thought, and I still do, I believe this, that through this COVID season that we're still going through, That God's going to be revealing that you are not God. That you don't have as much control as you think you do. So stop. Stop pretending like you do and start trusting the one that does. It's God's grace in our life to show us that we need him. So he calls us to love him because he is worthy, but we need him. And we see that following Jesus, making him Lord of all your life, means to trust and obey, which leads us to verse 13 and 14. And what, he, what Paul does here, as he's charging him to keep a command, and he says it in front of two witnesses. He says, in the presence of God, who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, we have a good confession before Pontius Pilate. 
I charge you to keep this command without failure or fault until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if your heart is beating, your lungs are breathing, this is God's evidence of God's love so you can know the presence of God's love. Again, Deuteronomy 6, what Jesus quotes, love the Lord your God with all your heart. If you're still alive, there's still time to know and love the Lord and to be known and loved by the Lord. Again, this is a heart and head connection. I can't get past that enough. So many people know so much and are missing Jesus. Only when you know God's love can you fully trade in your old way of life to trade up for the new way of life of knowing and being known by the Lord. A life lived out of love for the Lord is a life lived for the Lord. And so we seek to obey. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commands. This is the motivation for obeying. It's not to earn God's love. It's an outflow of knowing God's love, of being God's love as God's child. I think of my own kids. So my kids seek to obey me. Not perfect. They seek to obey me because they love me and they fear me. It's true. They love me and they fear me. They know that I love them. They know that I love them. Therefore, they trust that I have their best interest in mind. Because everything I do, the rules I set, the things I show, how I lead comes from a love for them. A sacrificial love, I would do anything for them and they know that. But they also fear me. Because there's consequences for disobedience, but they know my consequences come out of care, so I correct. And if I, being a flawed, sinful person, dad, how much more is our good father and how we can trust him in his leading and his guiding and the rules and the commands he sets so we trust him enough to obey even when we don't understand? Because there's going to be things in life that you just don't fully understand, but God calls us to it, so do you do it? Because you trust him. Because his ways are higher than your ways. And do we trust in him and not lean on our own understanding? And what we see here is that you're alive because of God's graciousness. Number two, Jesus hasn't returned yet because of God's patience. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord does not delay his promise. That is his coming. As some understand delay. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Meaning, if you're alive today, and you still are rejecting Jesus, you refuse to believe, you make every excuse humanly possible, what it really comes down to, you like being your own God and like having control, which you have none of anyway, there's still time for you to repent and confess. And I know this is hard language, but man, I want to get through that Jesus is better. It's not a threat. We, some people come to Jesus and say, you know, I don't want to go to hell, so Jesus is better. That's not what we're saying here. Jesus is better than life. Jesus is better than anything that you'll ever encounter, any relationship you'll ever have, any donut you'll ever eat. Jesus is better. And if we know that, it will change every aspect of your every day. You'll hold things looser, and you'll cling to him tighter. You can see why anger issues go down, because we get angry because we seek and we want and we do not have. And we don't understand. And our perfect plans don't happen as perfectly as we think they should. But we realize that God is sovereign over all things in every moment. We trust him. And we see Jesus' first coming was to save sinners. Jesus came the first time to save sinners. Matthew 9, Jesus says, It's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. We all have this sickness called sin. And we can't do anything about it. It's incurable under our own. But Jesus, who lived a perfect life because you and I couldn't, died the death to satisfy God's wrath that we couldn't satisfy, took an, our place, dying the death that we deserved, so that we could live by faith in what he did and take his righteousness and trade it for our unrighteousness. And now we are called righteous children of God. This is an unfair trade. This is trading up if I've ever heard it. And if we really understood the gravity and significance of this, 
everyone would jump in knowing the God of all creation, the universe, loved you so much that he took your place on the cross so that you could live with him for eternity because this is the relationship that you were created to have in the first place. He came the first time to save sinners, but he's coming the second time to save believers. And for those unbelievers, it will be a dreadful, terrifying day. But for believers, this is a call to endure. So keep enduring. Also known, looking up. You know, I've taught all of our kids how to ride a bike. And all of our kids that know how to ride a bike, those who are bike riding age, because I have some that are not, those that can ride a bike, their first temptation is to look down at their wheel. And they ride and they're looking down like, look up, look up, look up, and they look back down. One kid, I won't tell you her name, but she's currently (laughs) 19. It's currently 19, and it's quite a few years ago. She was riding her bike down the sidewalk, and she kept looking down, looking down, like, look up, and the sidewalk started turning, and she ran right into a fire hydrant. I said, see? No, I didn't say that. But keep looking up, because what happens when you look down, you get sidetracked, and you don't see the bigger picture. So what if we kept our eyes fixed on Jesus, and when the storm comes... When life's storms rage, that illness sets in, the loss of a loved one, things don't know, you don't understand what's going on. You lose a job. Your finances aren't what they want to be. Your relationships are hurting. What if you just kept focusing on Jesus, know, knowing that he's still sovereign over things? And believe it or not, even though you may not know it, he does work all things for good, those who are called according to his purpose and who love him. What if we believe that? And knowing that even when something doesn't go your way, he may be working out something for someone else. Because we get so self-centered, and we're y'all good people. We get so self-centered that we can't see beyond ourselves and think, oh my goodness, this ain't going my way, but what if God's using it for someone else? What if God's using my suffering for someone else? What if God will use my suffering for someone else? I know many of you have a testimony where you've been through cancer, and now your cancer is in remission, but God has used your suffering in cancer to now minister to those who are suffering in a like way because you can only understand what they are going through in a way that they are going through it. Does that make sense? Maybe a little bit. Nothing's wasted. And so keep enduring, keep looking up, and that also wants to feel the urgency. So we look up and we look around, feel the urgency because we have an area all around us where many are going through life without the hope of Jesus. So let me ask you this. Who is your one? Who is the one person in your spheres of influences that doesn't know Jesus right now? Who's your one? And are you praying for them? If not, start. One person. Start praying for them and praying for them, praying for them. And see what God does through you in that relationship as you pray and as you seek to share the hope that's in Jesus alone. Who's your one? I want us to feel the urgency because time is running out. I don't know when the Lord may either call me, him, whoever else home, or when he returns. Feel the weight and the urgency here and to the ends of the earth. And finally, as we close in verse 15 and 16, it says, God will bring this about, being his coming, in his own time. He is only, he is blessed only sovereign. The King of kings, lords of lords, who alone is immortal, who's li- who lives in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal power. And this is so interesting to me. One, he's coming. And two, it says, He is the only sovereign. He is the king of kings. That means he is over all kings, all power, all leadership. And he is the Lord of lords. That means over Lord over everything, king, ruler over everything, including you. This is God. And Revelation 19, 16 shows us this is Jesus. We get this vision in Revelation 19 when Jesus returns. And he returns, and it says in Revelation 19, 16, that he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is Jesus. Coming as a sacrificial lamb, he's coming back as a conquering 
king. He came to save sinners, coming back to save believers and to establish his kingdom. He is king. So we focus and we endure. But notice that he stands in unapproachable light. Again, symbolism for his holiness, his purity, his righteousness, meaning we cannot approach him. Unapproachable light, unless something changes in our life. There's a trade that happens. Romans 3 says it like this. Verse 22, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all, that's a lot of people, all who believe. Since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this is a deal. We are all born sin and sinners. Unrighteousness. And nothing we can do about that. This is why Jesus, the only righteous one, the perfect one, took our place so that through faith in him, believing that somehow his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, counted for me, we at that point are declared righteous. And because we are righteous, we can now stand before the Lord on the day of judgment in his inapproachable light because we are declared righteous. Because he's righteous. Aside from Jesus, you will never be right enough. Never. So as we respond, I, I encourage you to think through what this trading up means. We have the opportunity before a holy God to trade in our lives. The lives that do have worth because God created you in his image. But are we pursuing God and his worthiness. Jesus showed you his worth by dying so that you can live. Trading his life for your... Do you believe that? If so, let's start living like it. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and we're going to respond. And like we do every week, I encourage you to respond to what God's doing in your life at this moment. What are those things that you've been trading Jesus for in your life? Sacrificing him for, for this thing or that thing or it. Seeking satisfaction. Where have you been putting God at a lower priority? What have you been idolizing? What have you been worshiping? We started off talking about the love of money. Maybe that's it in your life. What are the things that you love more than the Lord himself? I'm going to listen to the time of response. And as we respond, we're going to pray. And then we're going to sing. And as we sing, I, I invite you to respond to what God's doing. Maybe it's you continue to pray right where you are because God's laying something in your heart that you need to deal with before him. Maybe you come together with a few around you and pray. We'll have a prayer team over here. Let's pray for you. Let's walk alongside you. But I'm going to call us to a time of repentance. Because this is what turning is. Repentance is you see where you've fallen short and you turn and pursue the Lord. Trading that thing for his glory. I'm going to close with this and then we're going to pray. Here are the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. So let's pray. Let's respond. Father, right now, we just ask that you would lead us in this time of responding to what you're doing in our lives. Show us the areas where we have wandered away from you. We've strayed away. We've believed the lie. We've been misled. We've chosen our ways over your ways. We've chosen control over submission. 
We've tro- chosen disobedience rather than to obey. We've chosen trust in ourselves versus trust in you. Father, right now I ask that you reveal any blind spots that we may have in our lives that we didn't even notice, that we didn't even know that we're elevating above loving you, that we've loved these things, we've loved the created thing over the creator himself. Show us these things and break our hearts for prioritizing our ways and our things over you. Lord, continue to show us how amazing your love is. How amazing your grace is and how your love never fails and you never give up on us and you never forsake us. You are always with us. That your love is everlasting and unending and you're faithful throughout the generations and we can call on you knowing that you're faithful and just and will forgive us our sins when we confess them. So right now, bring us to a heart of repentance and worship our realization of who you are, because you are worthy. You are worth it. You are worth all of our lives. You are worth all of our possessions. You are worth all of our time. You are worth it. You are better than life. Lord, lead our hearts. Lord, lead us as we desire to respond well to you. We thank you, Father. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> On behalf of The Way Church, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. As a church, we desire to come alongside you on your faith journey to encourage you, to equip you, and to pray for you. So right now, would you let us know what God's doing in your life? You can go online and fill out our Connect card at thewaychurchrva.com. And for those who want to continue worshiping through giving, Because we believe that giving is out of a heart of worship, you can do so securely again online at thewaychurchrva.com. And so church, let's go and continue to be the church and love God, love others, and make disciples.